entire war on, on their land. And this, you know, they feared. So they wanted to set up their best defense system. And they figured that the most obvious place for the Nazis, now this is Germany, but I'm going to distinguish between Nazi Germany and today's Germany by calling them Nazis. The Nazis entering through the natural border. So they through the natural border. So they, they entrench along what's called the Maginot Line. And that's where their, the bulk of their defenses were. Um, now Hitler knows this. And he is going to, when he decides to invade France, he's going to come through his back door. And he's going to employ his Dynamo Man. Dynamo Man is very important to the story. Diedrich von Schultitz. Diedrich von Schultitz becomes the general responsible for the defense of Paris in August of 1944. Okay? But here, his job is to destroy Rotterdam. Rotterdam is getting pummeled, bombarded. The Dutch are surrendering, but the, uh, the surrender is not communicated to the front, from the front lines, or to the front lines. Um, so Rotterdam is, is a brand new city because it was completely destroyed. The Nazis then go to Amsterdam at that point. The city looks like it, it once did, and uh, that's because the Dutch had surrendered. Now they're going to come through Belgium. The Belgians didn't do much. They let them come right through, and now is where it becomes very important to, to France. Um, so they're going to be coming through the Ardennes region, the mountainous region, and the Parisians feel like they're going to have, they're, they're going to be conceding uh, Paris. There's this battle of Dunkirk, which is the big battle. For some reason, Hitler um, ordered a halt to the progress so that some of the troops who were being uh, surrounded could be escaped back to Britain, so there were British troops there. This was a big deal. Many of the French felt that they wanted to get out before, you know, they were trapped behind enemy lines. Uh, so, in this case, at that point, when they come through the Ardennes, the Ballad Dunker, the, the Paris is going to be conceded. The French know that. They make preparations. They hide the stained glass from Notre Dame, for example, and replace it with plate glass. They're going to take the Louvre and all the, um, all the art, as much as they can, they're going to store it to prevent the Nazis from looting. Um, the Nazis arrive in Paris. As they arrive, the president is going to step down. President Reno steps down, and the, the most senior general, General Marshal Pétain, is going to step into the role of the leader of the nation. He is going to agree with the Nazis to a path of collaboration. Collaboration. So the citizens heard about this, and you can imagine the, the, the jokes could be said that the people just put their hands up. It is the leadership which, in fact, agreed. And you can think in, in your own time, um, maybe now, what other alternatives that they have. I will make no excuses for anybody, but in this case, they seemed, there seems to be a big dialogue about what other ways they could have dealt with this. Um, and you can think, well, now I'll tell you a little bit more, but you can think they, they went further, they went farther rather than, than, they, than they needed to, so there's a lot to say about this. Anyhow, the path of collaboration, which what, what was agreed to was to move the capital to Vichy. Vichy is in the south. Uh, the administrative body for the French uh, moving to Vichy. Well, now we know this as Vichy, France. The Nazis controlled the northern part. Since there was no major opposition, the Nazis didn't have to fear you know, and, uh, uh, staged uh, all battles, so they, they didn't have to expend too many resources in protecting. This wasn't like a military state in the north. And then, of course, in the south, their presence was limited as well. Now, you have to remember there was standing armies in North Africa. It's strange, I know, but the French had uh, um, military forces which were not under the direction of the occupying Vichy. Now, at the same time as Patan uh, took over, um, uh, the most junior general, and nobody ever really heard of, Charles de Gaulle, went to Britain. He gets on the radio. The people who are horrified, they're losing their country um, in such a short period of time, they all of a sudden hear the voice. You can see the speech under the Arc de Triomphe, by the way. It's a very moving speech. The just the gist of which he's saying we may have lost the battle, but we have not lost the war. It goes on to really, it's really moving, but not everybody heard it. Those who did will account for it being a very uh, moving speech. So de Gaulle encourages finally in his speech um, to for all the forces, all those who are protecting the Maginot Line, 
Anybody who wishes to join him in England, come to England. Any of the soldiers, come to England. Those who didn't clearly had to do something. They, they took off their uniform or they actually went with Vichy. Um, those who took off their uniform, a lot of them might, will have joined the resistance, which was not big from the start. The next stop is uh, to talk to you about the resistance. I wanted to tell you, though, that uh, Patan, being the case that he might have had no other choice, didn't have to move the Vichy government into the So he starts out, there's Liberté, Egalité, and Fraternité, is are the France, so liberty, equality, and brotherhood. He changes those. He changes them to uh, patrie, so country, famille, uh, family, and travail, and work. So no longer is this equality thing happening. So this is really helpful to them when the Nazi soldiers and officers are going to need places to stay. The Marais is a very nice area with great housing stock. Also happens to be a very Jewish area. Originally, about uh, many Jewish men were sent to labor camps to work for the Nazis. Uh, there was this event called the Valdi Roundup that is uh, documented in a book, a fictionalized book. Much of it is nonfiction, called Sarah's Key. Anybody here? So Sarah's Key is about the Valdi Roundup. It's a velodrome in the in the winter uh, of '42. He, uh, the Vichy government helped get 80,000 men, women, and children out of their homes. They were supposed to be sent to uh, labor camps, but they were sent, yes, to a French camp, and they were sent directly to Auschwitz. The memorial behind us, which we won't be able to go into today, typically this trip doesn't take us in there, it's just too long a line, um, it commemorates the 200,000 French who were deported during this time. Uh, of occupation, there were only 3% returned. Um, the narrow passageway, which uh, leads to the staircase in which you'll enter this memorial, you're meant to feel the sort of oppression, the brutalistically hewn concrete along the sides, and then at landing. The landing is uh, huge 25 foot walls. You can see the sky, but you can't quite get there. There's an aperture to the uh, Seine. It's um, got steel bars on it and a jagged sculpture, so you, it, it seems ominous and it's very difficult to imagine that it's a tranquil sen. Uh, and then there's a narrow passage leading into a, a chamber that commemorates the 200,000 deportees with a pebble for each deportee, and there's a tomb of the unknown deportee, and quite a bit more. Um, this was inaugurated in 1962 by Charles de Gaulle. Um, we could take a look at the uh, um, so during the four years, the Nazis they experienced this city as rest and relaxation. This is r and This is the, for some soldiers it was the best time of their life. They were going to coffee shops and bars and brothels and cabarets, and there was really no resistance. They were eating. Obviously, the Nazis devalued the money from the French. The Nazis had all the buying power. They commandeered all the wine supply. This was great, so by no means would we have expected anything to happen in the resistance. The communists are going to capitalize on this. They know the allies are not going to come in this direction. They say we have to do something to encourage them. They printed out these lithographs, all these posters, um, which they thought would encourage the patriotic French um, who have been itching to fight the Nazis to join the, the movement. Um, and they decide on the morning of the 19th at 8 in the morning they're going to take the prefecture building and they're going to start this uprising. Now the Gaullists would have been opposed to this because they didn't want the, the death, they didn't want the destruction to the city. I mean, urban warfare, you can destroy a lot of these buildings and they didn't have huge numbers. Uh, but then they hear about the fact that the communists are going to so Alexander Parody is the leader of the Gaullists. He and a few of his men discuss the fact that the communists are going to do this. They say they're going to come here at 8, we're going to come here at 7 in the morning and take this building. Um, I, can't even, I can't tell you how, that sounds a little silly, but that's how it went. So 7 in the morning on August 19th, 1944, the Gaullist uh, faction of the resistance is going to take the prefecture building. From the Nazis. Now, I'm going to tell you, by the end of the day, they're already running out of ammunition. So you got to imagine, this wasn't like a huge arsenal. They weren't a huge company of men. Um, they will depend on the fact that there are going to be reinforcements. And that reinforcements will be the communists. So come here at 8, find that the building's taken, 
and they're going to go to Hotel the Hill. The communists are going to stage their uh, insurrection from there. They're also going to be taking all of the mairies, all of the police prefectures and the 20 arrondissements, that's going to be their objective, to take those from the Nazis and then to stage an urban war. So you can see tons of photos of like barricades throughout the streets. The communists had a lot more weapons. These guys are going to be running out. But first thing that happens, they take the building, first act of warfare against the Nazis. The, the, the routine patrol is going to be coming through here. A truck, a Nazi truck, routine patrol, and a mod of cocktails is going to be thrown from this building. It's going to light the truck on fire. One of the soldiers is going to be on fire. Another is going to um, evacuate from the truck, looking to see where it came from. He has no clue. He's going to go around the side of the building behind us here, and uh, he's going to determine that, like a good soldier, he's going to go back the way he came because there was no gunfire in that direction. Now, the communists destroyed the wiretapping equipment the evening before, so he can't get in touch with Command Central. So he's going to literally run all the way to the Hotel Maurice, which is our next stop, uh, besides for the two stops in between about the uh, life under the uh, occupation. Um, our next stop about the World War, the war Battle. So he runs all the way over there and says, what's the matter? Don't you know my men are burning like sausages? And von Schultz, who had no idea, is going to have to move into action. And like I said, he's just been placed here in August, beginning of August. Hitler personally places him here. And he doesn't want to commit troops to fighting a, a battle either. He's concerned about the Allies. And Hitler has his ear saying, like, look, you got his parents burning him. His parents burning him. We're going to walk through the driving car and back down this time. Nazis and officers and soldiers. Uh, if you had a taxi, taxi drivers had a choice. They could pay a lot to retrofit their uh, engine with a gasogene tank. It was a wood burning tank. Uh, it was very expensive. Um, so most of them opted to cut their taxis in half and they would race bicycles onto them. And there began the, the velo taxi. Of course, the finest, the fastest velo taxi drivers were Tour de France uh, racers. Um, so you had them flying through the city. You also had people on their bikes. People on their bikes and, uh, and horses. Clock, clock, clock was the sound that you more like to hear. And then bikes. The metro was to get reduced. People obviously they had to work their jobs. Um, and as I said, they were getting you know deflated pay. Pay wasn't very good. On the, I'll tell you in a bit about a little bit about the black market that you could buy goods on, but you needed quite a bit more money than any particular job would afford you. So you had to have a storage of, of money, I suppose. Um, now, the um, the the Nazis um, were were having a, a good old time, right? Now the French were trying to improvise, so they're swimming in the river at this time of the year. This was like a big swimming pool. I would not swim in these days. Um, they were going to horse races. The horse races still uh, were happening. Um, very importantly, they were resisting by maintaining their French way of life. So when the Nazis res restricted their amounts of wine to three nights a week, this was a problem. The fact that there was no coffee around was a major problem. So they improvised. They got acorns and chickpeas and they crushed them up, double filtered them, and they made what was called Café National. They'd sit there across the legged or however they sit at the cafes and they'd sit maintaining that tradition. I was telling you about the, the metro. Metro was reduced to um, uh, stopping at 11 a.m., resuming at 3 p.m., and then the final train at 11. It doesn't seem so bad. Now, curfew was midnight. If you were caught after midnight, you would be taken to prison. You would be taken to prison and you would shine shoes. And if anything happened to, say, uh, Bridge being destroyed, any act of sabotage, rail lines, or any Nazi soldier having problems, they would take you from your shoe shining and they would execute you. Just like that, to make an example. Um, it's at this time that I want to tell you a little bit about the uh, rest of it. The next stop is going to be in the Louvre. I'll tell you a bit about the food stuff. So, you know, there were some pretty bad rations that they had to make here. They were taking lard and spilling sugar on it, and that's just the kind of thing they were eating. Uh, but the principal crop, maybe maybe you've had it, uh, the principal crop for animals was now being consumed by people. It was uh, rutabaga. We have rutabaga. 
rutabaga. So that's, that was their staple. They were eating rutabaga as much as any human could conceivably uh, eat rutabaga. Does anybody not know what it tastes like? It's kind of bland and earthy. Um, that's, that was their major food steps. So in the next stop, I'll, I'll continue talking about uh, Keep in mind, while we're, while we're headed to the Louvre, um, how different the city was in that town and how overjoyed. I mean, you have such a nice place to, uh, you know, you got a nice apartment. Uh, there seems to be no problem if you're, if you're in the Nazi places. No pathetic. The Vichy government, though, the Vichy started getting worse on the resistance. The Vichy created a police. I told you they got nasty, they got nasty. They created a police called the Milice. The Milice were responsible, they were French, responsible for capturing French members of the resistance. Um, it's down here. The fortress was established in the 1330s. There's some a residence here. Um, so you can see that if you came inside, that's by Charles V. Um, the, the next major, major move is Francois I is going to employ the Italian Renaissance to build the long galleries uh, that we'll see when we walk out here. But basically it had been built up through Napoleon III, whose apartments he stopped, who was still in power in the 1870s. Um, so it's pretty extensive history. Apparently um, it should take about five months to visit the Louvre, so if you only have one day, um, give it a shot. Otherwise, <laughs> there's another film, uh, another museum I'll point out to you, the Musée d'Orsay, that's a little more concise. Uh, we stopped here because Hitler had a uh, work of art here in storage that he took from Bayou, which was very important to him. The Bayou Tapestry. It's not, in fact, a tapestry. If you do some more research on that, the tapestries are embroidered. This is woven. But that's what they call it, and, it, and it's kind of complicated, but Harold, be, uh, it's the story of Harold and William the Conqueror, the Battle of Hastings, the fact that the French were in England for quite a while, uh, 300 years. It is going to establish for Hitler um, some major significance as a major work of art. And you know, if he's the, uh, the head of the, he conquers Europe, he wants that piece. They're going to retreat before he gets that piece. It's going to go back to Bayou, but it was here in the now, most of the art, like I said, would have been collected and uh, wrapped up. There might be stress marks in some pieces and stored all over the city, wherever they could, so the Nazis wouldn't loot it. They did loot as much as they could. They were caught off guard, though. Um, in some cases, I generally don't, like I said, sympathize, but I, I give at least a uh, you know, point of view. The few cases that I've read, there will be some situations where a Nazi soldier living in somebody's house has broken a couple crystal goblets and they'll leave a note, sorry I broke your glasses, leaving a little bit of money, um, or I dog-eared the three-volume fold there that you had, so I replaced it. For the most part, this is very generous, for the most part they would have got out of here um, with what they could. Now, I told you to tell you about, a little bit about the food, uh, some rations, uh, no more, no butter. 2.3 ounces of margarine, a piece of meat that would fit on a metro ticket, provided they would jump, provided that the conductor didn't push a hole through the ticket so they wouldn't fall through. Um, in fact, this city was like a country village. Uh, they were raising roosters and chickens in their houses. You can open closets and find these animals. Rabbits in bathtubs, stealing blades of grass to feed their rabbits, um, risking their lives. For that. Um, they didn't have much fuel, as I said, so one newspaper advertised it balled up its pages, sprinkled water on it, and you could pour it on the pot of water with that. Um, Jacques Cousteau at this time is going to be um, inventing the uh, regulator for the pressurization of gas. Uh, so the application will be with uh, scuba, that's the secondary application. Um, the Nazis are out enjoying themselves. Once again, I have to return to that name. Edith Piaf is singing to them. She's singing anti-Nazi songs. They don't touch her. She's got a golden voice. Um, the French, their system of uh, entertainment. They're taking a generator. They're bracing four bikes on it. They're biking six hours to power two films. A uh, family of four could go to dinner on the black market. Um, the, the equivalent of twice a secretary's salary three-month periods. A lot of money they had to save just to go out to it. Of course, there was an extensive black market. People were doing what they had to uh, to survive um, the 
there's all sorts of other stories, but the last one we do is about 200,000 kids were born to the union between, uh, I say union, the relationship between French um, and Nazis. So those kids still exist. I actually met a guy here who uh, was the product, living in San Antonio, the product of his grandmother was, uh, they called them Vichy collaborators. You'll come to find out, I can jump the gun here. Um, at the end of the, the occupation, the Vichy women, these women I'm speaking of, will have their heads shaved and paraded around the city in their negligees, um, embarrassed. Um, and this woman, in fact, uh, would have left um, and, and left to Texas and continued her life. So a lot of I'm going to move us to this guy. Yeah. machine gun fire with a blast of a tank. They won't destroy the city outright. Um, here though there was a secondary um, uh, success of having a French tank uh, troop. Um, the tank registers see the panzer here, the German panzer tank. They were quicker. Uh, in this case they, they were poised to engage in battle. Now the French uh, tank gunner is going to have registered 1500 meters. And he's going to realize, and he remembers in his history books when he was a student, that the Sol's these days called Cave. So he's going to add 300 more meters to this shot. And he's going to get pretty much a direct hit, just narrowly missing the obelisk onto a panzer. The panzer's going to lose power. It's also going to break its tread. Um, so it's going to manually operate its, its tank, its gunner. And uh, another uh, French tank is going to approach from the north. It's going to be coming south. There's another uh, a panzer coming from back here behind the Musée de Orange Pays. Um, that tank is going to fortunately have a problem. Its gun is going to run into a tree. So it's not going to be able to fire a shot. Are these guys done with So he's going to put the pedal to the metal and bust right into the tank. He's going to knock it on its side. The, uh, the, the soldiers inside are going to evacuate. And this is on a larger scale. This is why they're called a machine gun firing. There's going to be a machine gun battle here. Um, as soon as I said, as this is under control, they're going to go to the Maurice and get the commander. As soon as this is under control, De Gaulle is going to be called. You must come quickly. De Gaulle is going to fly from Gibraltar. He's going to fly here. Um, he's supposed to be met in the air above Normandy by planes. Uh, but they get as far as Normandy and a plane doesn't meet them. So he arrives and still in the air above, above London and then turns around. Apparently with very little fuel left, they arrive in Paris. He has his own uh, men meet him, his own housing. Like I said, he's a nuisance to the Allies, so he doesn't arrange anything with them. His men tell him you have to go to the Hotel de Ville. You're going to need to be uh, giving your speech uh, for your inauguration. He says, I can't. I have to go to the prefecture first. So that's what he does. He goes by the prefecture. He takes the guys there, brings it to the Hotel de Ville. One of the members of the communist uh, uh, resistance is going to hand him a speech. He's not going to read that speech. He's going to get on a the balcony there at Hotel de Ville. He's going to have this guy holding him by the belt. 
case he gets shot, um, so he won't fall over. And he's going to give a speech, uh, and the communists are going to be waiting to hear what he has to say. And as they, he gives the speech, he continues, he's halfway through, the communists are waiting, waiting for it to be mentioned, what their involvement is in the government. As he gets to the very end of the speech, he never once mentions them. And they know they've been had at that point. They had no responsibilities in the government. They had been given no power. Um, that's possibly why they might have been the ones firing the shots in the parade the next day. So, those two collaborators are going to have their heads shaved. The men got their deal, but the men like Marshal Patan is going, are going to be in, in a trial. He's going to get the death penalty for Patan, but he is going to be uh, too old. He's 85 years old, so he'll go ahead and die in prison. Um, if you can imagine that parade, the soldiers, you've seen pictures probably of the soldiers in the, from the Allied forces met their wives on that day. This was a big, grand celebration. Of course, the war in Europe is still going on until May of 45, so quite a bit longer. But if you can imagine that parade coming through here, you can see footage of it. That's where De Gaulle would have lit, lit the, fi uh, the flame. So it was extinguished well, all the way through here and to where we just came from. And maybe you can imagine it in your heads. The you know, Marseillaise has a couple of lines that are a little bit savage uh, about killing. And they were very happy um, beyond belief because this city could have been completely destroyed. And as it is, it remains the Paris that uh, we, we know and we find uh, to be the jewel in Europe, the most visited city in the world. That's the story.